Welcome back to Plastic Weekly. Uh, this week, we're doing something a little bit different. This is five on, five off. If anybody's been a long time viewer and before that listener back to when this was an audio podcast, we once, once did a segment with me and some friends talking about issues of the day in a five minute format per topic. And we're going to try bringing it back. This is a very scuffed edition. The overlay is completely made <laughs> up five minutes ago. Uh, but who else to join uh, uh, on this episode? Somebody else I know can talk forever talking about uh, climbing stuff stuff is good friend albert oak albert thanks for joining me how are you doing man i'm doing okay as usual you know nothing changes i'm always okay albert okay it's my brand it's who i am <laughs> it's my last name i was born this way so yeah has the has the internet convinced you to pronounce your name okay consistently yet or uh, or are you holding strong with your family name yeah i've given up since birth because the first thing i was told was okay and i was like yeah it's you're not wrong. <laughs> the first thing you were told? What do you mean by that? Like the first time anybody pronounced my name, like when I like heard on roll call for school, was just like, okay. And I just really, I respond to anything now. I, I, you can like make guttural noises and I'll probably respond to you. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know. Man. Yeah. Uh, five on five off. Really simple. Uh, in this episode that we're trying, uh, I have two questions for Albert. He has two questions for me. And of course we'll discuss it five minutes per topic. And uh, if you're ready to go, I'm going to start with my first question. Albert, are you uh, are you ready to uh, launch into the crucible that is five on, five off? I think I'm as ready <laughs> as any comp climber is ready when they're about to step on the wall. They're not, and then they get ready once they touch the first hold. All right, shock up. Cross your fingers. Here we go. Okay. Uh, all right, clock's running. So the question, this all started on your Instagram story. You did a bit of an AMA. And the question I posed to you that you couldn't answer in a single story was... I'm going to add to it a little bit, but basically what's your take on us climbers that don't take the comp circuit seriously. And if they or sorry, why don't a lot of us climbers, outdoor climbers and uh, specifically really take the comp circuit seriously and try and participate in it. And if they did, who would have the best bet of making an impact on the circuit? So who, if you could pull them from, from the grasp of J tree and red rocks, cause you pull out, throw on the circuit and would actually do some damage. So it's really interesting when we talk about why a lot of U.S. climbers don't really take the World Cup circuit seriously is because I've obviously had firsthand experience with being around other uh, World Cup climbers. And they all talk about pretty much the same problem that there's no uh, union basically for them. So the USA Climbing gives very little financial support. They have very little financial incentive to go. They struggle even getting hotel rooms. They struggle getting meals. They struggle getting transportation. Whereas other countries, like uh, let's say Austria, I know that um, Anna Storr and Killian Fischuber, they came to Texas recently, or I don't know, maybe like a couple of years ago, and they're technically... A, on the military and so the military funds their travel they like can get them liaisons between um uh different like the hotel and the venue uh japan has a very strong uh jmca they have uh the funding for their athletes as well so that's a reason why a lot of them don't want or like it's they kind of get burnt out really quick because so they when you say union you, you don't mean like uh like a labor union where it's advocating for for you know uh worker protections and stuff you're talking about like a uh uh basically a, a, an nso a national sport organization that yeah. gives funds for getting them to these comps mm -hmm. there there is there are funds but it's very limited and only like maybe one or two people really get it and so that's been one of the biggest problems that a lot of USA climbers have faced trying to get into World Cups. And they just have to rely on sponsors, funding themselves. But recently, because uh, USA climbing has taken a bigger step into being more uh, of a participant in putting climbers into World Cup circuits, I think it's going to be able to push some climbers and make them more attracted to the idea of World Cup climbing. Like Carlo Traversi, I know he was really psyched when the combined format came out. I think he's sort of given up on that. I don't know how much he's <laughs> given up on it, but he was like psyched. He like learned how to kind of speed climb. And so like climbers like him, he's so experienced. He probably could do still decently well at World Cups. Um, obviously, I've even talked to Alex Puccio's mom and she was like, yeah, Alex Puccio probably will come back to the circuit and try it again. But there's a lot of outdoor exclusive climbers that probably would do really well. I mentioned on my story uh, this under like undercover crusher, Austin Gaiman, and he 
exclusively climbs outdoors. He's from Colorado Springs, and he's trained with like Megan Mascarenas. He's trained uh, with uh, Alexis Mascarenas, and in fact, he's like dating her. And so he's around and with the knowledge of how to become a top World Cup athlete. But I just don't think there's enough interest. There's no um, incentive to like. You can pretty much get a lot more notoriety and enjoyment in life if you just climb outdoor rocks in America. But if you grind and you make semifinals, nobody really cares in America. And and that's kind of like a really sad thing. And that's why a lot of them just don't go for the circuit. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if Jimmy Webb really trained coordination. He probably could do well still. Like, I, I, this sounds crazy, but I, I seriously think he could still throw down still probably like make semifinals he just like knows how to climb so well that he can get by um there's a lot of female climbers that i think when the whole uh, meta shift turned into like dino and parkour style they just were scared and turned off by it but i think they're all very capable if you gave them you know like a full year of training on how to do dinos coordination and so those are some of the names I throw around that probably still could do really well. Opposed from that, from bouldering side, I think almost all the lead climbers in America have so much endurance. And in lead climbing, there's not going to be that many crazy like uh, coordination moves opposed to bouldering. So almost all the lead climbers, if they tried, could definitely do well on the lead circuit. And I think that is about time. <laughs> You just like seconds. dragged that all the way out right to the time. <laughs> nice job. All right, man. You get what's your what's your first question? What uh, okay. what are we talking about? So this is something for you because you're a lot more in the industry side of things. Is will the climbing industry collapse in the future? Uh, <laughs> like, is it is it ballooned out? Like, have we hit critical mass? Uh, are you talking uh, like specifically like gyms. people? We're talking about like not comps so much, but not uh, yeah. okay. So like climbing as in like recreational yeah. climbing or whatever uh -huh. will it collapse i i i don't think it will ever collapse to zero it's not if anybody's like looked into sports that just absolutely fall apart the 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 archetypal one is high lie right it's a ridiculous sport manufactured by a dude spread around the world and just fell apart um uh, and another one we joke about, uh, I don't know if it's as big a thing in the States, but a joke in Canada with climbing gyms is like half of the climbing gyms in the country used to be racquetball uh, rooms, right? Like especially in universities. And so wherever you find a climbing gym in a university, it used to be a racquetball club. And those are just like gone the way <laughs> of the dodo. I don't think you're ever going to see an outright collapse. I think the fundamentals of a sport like climbing are 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 really strong from a user perspective. Um, it's relatively low cost uh, in terms of equipment. There's not much you need. You can do it on your own, which is uh, really important. You can also do it with other people as a group activity. So the bones of it just as a sport are uh, excellent. And the other part is it's actually a really safe uh, sport. Um, you and I both know that injuries are, are possible, um, but it's got all these really good things about it from the participant side of things. From the business side, like from the facility side is, I don't think anything's going to change about it being a really high down payment business to get into. Like if you want to open your own climbing gym, it costs some money. Um, you can't just get a building, you have to build the walls inside it. And so that becomes a bit of a hindrance. But because there's so much popularity behind it. The people that are opening one gym are usually opening two and then opening three. And you're seeing these bigger brands and getting the fact that venture capital and climbing is probably a sign that there's like probably some kind of bubble. I don't trust the idea of venture capital coming in who are used to like very rare infrequent successes is a good sign necessarily, but they seem to think that some of these businesses are a good bet. Um, I think most likely is at some point climbing will peak and I think you'll see some gyms go out of business. I think in general, you will see the bigger chains become the dominant form of climbing. Um, you're not going to see like, I don't know if it ever really was a thing, but the idea of like a, a local fitness gym or a local boxing gym or whatever kind of built around one coach, I don't think that's really going to be the dominant type of, uh, of business in the sport. But I think from a, uh, there were, I think there will always be customers uh, and there will always be gyms. People like 
the guys behind Waltopia and some other folks are always trying to find a way to like cut down the absurd cost of root setting, uh, which is super depressing when I think yeah. about it. I don't really like contemplating trying to um, basically destroy the uh, employment sector of climbing. That's really tough. Like if you imagine climbing as being like 90% customer service staff and then 10% or 10 percent like maintenance facility route setting. I think that's a bad uh, balance for a sport like this. Um, it becomes like low value because people on my side of the spectrum right now and customer service are generally considered low value workers, which is, is really depressing. So I think there's going to be a lot of change. I think, um, I think, I think it's mostly just going to homogenize a lot, which sucks. I think by the time I'm 70, I'm going to have a lot of like whiny gripes about the industry <laughs> and think it's all been like, you know, entirely whitewashed and everything's the same and it's all McDonald's and whatnot. But I don't think it's ever going to uh, collapse entirely. There will always be climbing. There will always be gyms. Something else might become fashionable. But I think, uh, I think you've got a pretty like, um, uh, I wouldn't worry about your city ever not having a climbing gym. That's what I would say. But my, I, I want to just follow up with you in the last 30 seconds. Like, is that something you've heard some people talk about? I'm curious if, uh, if people have speculated. I've heard of quite a few people speculating that like we're hitting critical mass. And once it does, it'll just like frizzle out and the fad's going to die. And it's going to be left with these like handful of endemic climbers that actually are climbers. And then that's it. Well, I'll, let me finish up my time by saying one, we're nowhere near saturation. It's still like less than 10% of the population in NA has ever climbed before. And kids always love climbing. Kids will always exist birthday parties forever. So anyway, that's my, yeah. that's my time. <laughs> okay. So my, my second and last question for you uh, is why is outdoor climbing media so much more pervasive than indoor or competitive climbing media? And what will it take for comp climbing to match that success? So the biggest thing whenever you uh, talk to about this question with me is, and, and this is kind of like the sad capitalism reality, is that there's no money in comp climbing. There is no $1 million tor dollar tournament or a competition in comp climbing that gets the attention of headlines. There's no real good marketability. But is anybody for... making a million dollars for sending some shit V14 for like the 14th time? Like, why is that more valuable? Exactly. But you can make a million dollars off an Oscar winning film. Okay. That's true. Yeah, right? Yeah, but he's yeah, a crazy yeah. person. It's not even the climbing. It's about him. Like, that's not about <laughs> him being a climber. That's him about him being, like, fucked up. That's a human interest. I don't know. Anyway, go ahead. That is true. That is true. But, like, if there was a lot more, like, the reason why a traditional, I think a lot of traditional sports get a lot more attention is because there's bigger names invested in, like, betting on it. Or there's, like, big tournament prizes and there's just a lot more money in investors with different companies in, like, football, let's say, or American football. And so it gets a lot more media hype if, like, Coca-Cola is, like, sponsoring the next IFSC World Cup. A lot of people, are, there's going to be headlines on it. Only recently, USA Climbing was on ESPN, I think, Channel 2 or Channel 3, like, one of the obscure lower channels, whereas, like, you turn on dart throwing and it's on ESPN 1, axe throwing, <laughs> ESPN 1. Like, there's way more money in axe throwing than in climbing, like, <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a lot more money in those competitions than climbing. And so that would give a lot more coverage in the media. But the other sort of side of this story is we have to think about the lay the, the layman of the uh, of society. We need to think about non-climbers and what they can understand and grasp is difficult and appealing. And when they see a mountain, they understand it's hard to get there. Like they think okay i obviously climbing everest is not that hard uh, i mean it's very hard but like the way it's set up with the chains and like the sherpas just taking all your stuff it's honestly not that difficult you just need to have five thousand dollars and you can get to the top so people think that's very difficult but when they see somebody just grab a crimp casually lock off and go to a next move on a plastic hold they don't think it's difficult and they don't they're not amazed by it at all they're more amazed if somebody campus rose moves on v0 and so that's like the that's like the hardest thing to convey to people that what when they're doing a coordination five five move paddle clutch dyno, that is infinitely harder than paying five thousand dollars and getting your stuff taken up to the top of Everest. And how do you change that? That is their biggest question. And I think 
based off of an American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> it's really I'm not going to like whatever this is, bro. It's it's I don't like it either, right? Like but American Ninja Warrior got it right. They over sensationalize how difficult those things are. Okay. I don't know if you've ever done an American Ninja Warrior course. No. It's honestly not that hard. Like if it you're look a, like it. <laughs> if you're a V7 boulder you're going to cruise through it. And the least, challenge honestly, is the time, right? It's the race aspect, I'm assuming, is the hard part, right? Yeah, I guess. But for, the, for, the, for the high-level Ninja Warrior athletes, like it's not yeah. like, will I like complete the challenge? It's more of like, can I get it done faster than the other guy? Yeah, exactly. And they over-sensationalize it. Like, what, running across that beam is infinitely easier than like the volume running that a climber is going to do. Right. But they make it such a big deal. And our commentators should not go to this direction. But <laughs> let's be honest. If if we had a commentator just going crazy, like, oh, my goodness, they can't believe it. He's hanging on the skin of his teeth. And he's, like, on a jug, right? He's just shaking out. <laughs> like, and putting that on, like, an ESPN Channel 1 or NBC network would seriously impact what, like, uh, normal lay p- people of society, non-climbers, would understand what's difficult. That's the biggest thing is describing that holding a crimp is very hard to someone that it just looks easy to. And so I don't want it to become like that, but maybe we have exhibition events All right, where next, it is over sensationalized. Next weekend, let's, let's re-record the commentary on a comp together and we'll just blow yeah. our lungs out talking shit over these things yeah. <laughs> like oh my goodness he yeah. hit the drug yeah yeah all right last question all right. so your last question is would a legend from the past if you give him like a few months or maybe a year would they be able to compete on the world cup circuit i'm gonna throw out some names that i wrote down okay killian for super anna Stor, uh sharma puccio obviously Good question, man. Mm. So, okay. So some of these people have been out like for a couple of years now from comps and a couple of them for like a really long time. Let's take, let's, let's just say Sharma. Cause the other one, let's like, let's use Sharma as an example of like being the highest level kind of celebrity um also yeah. in his time was a fairly high level climber i don't or maybe should, we should actually you know what let's use somebody like killian Fischhuber because okay. sharma never was like he really wasn't that huge an international like dominant force okay so somebody like killian he's been out for a couple of years um how, how long did you say training to get just back? give him like you know a year even oh a ye- hmm. six months to a year yeah, that's really, that's just uh, super interesting. Um, like you can, like, I, I'm sure you know this, like you can go back and look at a comp from six years ago and you use the word meta shift earlier in this, which resonates with me completely. Um, but oh, yeah, yeah, there you, it's an entirely different vocabulary of like movement and climbing that climbers have to do then that you do now. And anytime you want to compare like an, an Anna Storr of her peak in like 2013 to a Yanya Garnbrett in her current peak of 2019 the what they're climbing is completely different and it's really hard to to say that they're anything uh close to each other i would almost always say that the most recent climbing is the hardest climbing that's ever been done in competition if you look back six years ago it just doesn't look anywhere near as hard as the stuff is today and you go back another five or six years and the same thing it's just entirely different it's just generally far less complex uh so i worry about some athletes now killian he's been climbing more recently than that but i think my bias is that these people like maybe a year is enough maybe a year is enough but the the question i have in my head is if you have transitioned to being an outdoor climber and i don't have a good analogy for this but like i would use like being an outdoor climber is is like being a craftsman right you are Mm -hmm. you're trying to 
make a perfect object. You're trying to do the perfect send without time constraints. So it's it is kind of like some doing some like it's like creating a Fabergé egg where you know you're maybe not on a deadline, but you're trying to perfectly articulate this most beautiful expression of climbing. You're focused on one singular thing. A sing, like a, if you have like a year problem, a two year, a three year problem. You're thinking of like 12 moves for your entire life for three years, right? And that's all you're really training for is this very specific target. If I asked you, what are you training for on the comp circuit? You wouldn't be able to tell me what comps are coming up next year, depending on what time uh, you know you decide to compete. You wouldn't be able to tell me what walls they are, what holds they are. You don't know who the setters are. You don't know what the moves are going to be. You just have like a general idea. And so, being a comp climber, you have to over train for everything because you've never seen it before. You only have five minutes. It's completely different than projecting, um, which is this very targeted type of uh, of training. So, I think, like, if I if I had a better idea of like who they were going to compete against and maybe like what the walls were going to look like and if like let's say current field and like 2019 world cup circuit okay so killian fishuber comes in with we'll say one year of training mm -hmm. onto the boulder circuit honestly i still don't think he makes semifinals today i don't think so even dead last semifinals like one of the comps i think it could be like oh okay so if he does an entire circuit i think i would yeah. be I don't think it would be weird for him to make one semifinal maybe, but otherwise I wouldn't put him up there. The semifinals field is so strong. Like there, there were yeah. like no repeat male winners uh, in the Boulder comps last year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was um, yeah, independent. Yeah, everyone the field is so huge. Even if he trains on this stuff nonstop, I think he's going to get his ass like blown away. Not in a bad way. He'll still get some tops probably, but I don't think it'll mm -hmm. be enough to, to compete. No, if you've retired for like three years and you've stopped comp climbing and you're now an outdoor climber, I don't think you're coming back in. That's it for me. Dude, I would be so psyched to see that though. Like imagine the return. I would be too, man. I would be too. Yeah. And I mean, you're you're really good at gassing up climbers with no chance like Rishat Kaibulin. So I think you would be the, the first what? guy on that. <laughs> Uh, okay, I I admit that Rashad has a chance at the Olympics, but I'm never going to hear his name again ever after the Olympics. I'm certain of that. It is this Dude, is. I, I'll make sure you hear his name every day. <laughs> <laughs> I can unsubscribe really easily, man. It's all good. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get on your feed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for, for trying this very first episode of Five On, Five Off with me, Albert. I hope it wasn't too painful. And you did a great job of dragging it out the entire five minutes. Oh, man. Yeah, dude, solid. I can drag on anything, dude. <laughs> I'm sure we'll do this again soon. We'll do, uh, if there's a custom overlay, I'll invite you back when uh, whenever we get an actual overlay and we can uh, talk more shit. Uh, but for now, that was Five On, Five Off. Thanks again to Albert Oak. Make sure you check out his channel. Uh, it's just called Albert Oak. You can find him doing genuinely incredible videos about outdoor climbing indoor climbing it's a little bit vloggy sometimes a little bit lifestyle sometimes it's like really good analytical stuff he's doing uh uh you're are you you're trying to do every olympic climber like a profile on all of them to. right oh it's hard <laughs> of course he starts with Risha kaibulin um but check it out it's actually really good content uh and uh make sure you subscribe to his stuff as well uh other than that Thank you to the Patreons for supporting this channel, including the G5. If you want to get Plastic Weekly stickers or uh, be on one of these shows, you can pay me money to do that. Um, and then, of course, like and subscribe to this video. Join the Plastic Weekly Discord, and you can argue with Albert and I there if he's not playing League of Legends or whatever the hell he does with this time. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.